This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, public lecture. Uh, my name is uh, Ewan Morgan. I'm a uh, professor of United States Studies and head of U.S. programs at the Institute for the Study of the Americas. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, know the work of the Institute, uh, we exist to uh, facilitate and promote research in the Americas, and uh, events like this evening's are uh, uh, very much a part of that particular mission. Uh, we're delighted uh, to uh, record our appreciation that we have two co-sponsors for this evening's event. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, it is kindly funded by the John Coffin Memorial Fund, and it's co-sponsored by the Eccle Center for American Studies, uh, the Eccle Center for American Studies uh, located at the British Library. Uh, we do uh, a great deal of work in uh, our common uh, interest in research facilitation with the Eccles Centre. And I hope uh, that some of you may be interested. Uh, we have uh, another uh, talk by uh, uh, another distinguished uh, academic tomorrow night, uh, a fellow Princetonian in the person of uh, political science professor Fred Greenstein, uh, who will be talking about uh, the presidential difference, an examination of the contrasting leadership capabilities of James Buchanan and Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War era. And uh, For those of you interested, uh, there is a flyer for that event uh, on the uh, side. Uh, uh, but uh, more significantly, we are here tonight uh, to hear uh, Professor Linda Coney, the uh, Shelby M.C. Davis 1958 Professor of History at Princeton University, uh, deliver a talk connected to her re uh, a current research project. Uh, the talk will be entitled uh, Liberties and Empires, Writing Constitutions in the Atlantic World, 1776 to 1848. Uh, uh, now, many of you uh, will be familiar with uh, Professor Cody's work, uh, but uh, I'll offer a very brief overview of it. I think to do it justice, I'd have to speak for about an hour, but uh, uh, I'll uh, give some of the, what I consider to be the highlights. Uh, uh, she was the first female fellow of uh, Christ College Cambridge uh, before moving to take up a post at Yale University in 1982. And uh, she has written uh, numerous books in her specialist uh, subject area uh, of uh, British political history in the uh, 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, and uh, one of her books, uh, Britons Forging the Nation, 1707 to 1837, published in 1992, won the Wilson Prize for History. And it's just been reissued uh, as a, uh, a, a fifth paperback edition. Uh, in 1998, Professor Coley left uh, Yale to accept a senior Le Leverhill Research Professorship in History at the London School of Economics, where she continued her amazing uh, uh, productivity and uh, moved uh, then uh, in 2003 uh, to join the uh, History Department at Princeton University. Uh, her most recent work, The Ordeal of Elizabeth Marsh, a Woman in World History was nominated as one of the 10 best books of 2007 by the New York Times. In addition to this uh, amazing output of academic uh, uh, studies, uh, Professor Corey writes, uh, uh, she said occasionally, I think frequently would be a better word, uh, for uh, publications like The Guardian, The Times, The New York Times and The Times Literary Supplement. In 1999, she delivered the Prime Minister's Millennium Lecture at 10 Downing Street. And uh, she was, in the same year, elected a uh, Fellow of the British Academy. Uh, she's also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and of the Academia Europea. In 2009, she was awarded a CBE. And she's going to speak tonight, as I said, on her, uh, a, a subject connected to her current project. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand you over to Professor Cole. Good evening. It's a very great pleasure to be here. The Princeton historian R. R. Palmer published The Age of the Democratic Revolution some 50 years ago. Designed as a comparative constitutional history of Western civilization, 
Its two volumes charted the struggles after 1776 over ideas of popular sovereignty and civil and religious freedoms, and the spreading conviction that instead of being confined to privileged, closed, or self-recruiting groups of men, government might be rendered simple, accountable, and broadly based. Understandably, Palmer placed great emphasis on a contagion of new style constitutions. Between 1776 and 1780, 11 one-time American colonies drafted state constitutions. These went on to inform the US Federal Constitution of 1787, which in turn influenced the four revolutionary French constitutions of the 1790s, plus new constitutions in Haiti, Poland, Holland, and elsewhere. By 1820, continental Europe alone had generated at least 50 written constitutions. A further 80 constitutions were drafted between 1820 and 1850, many of them in Latin America. The transcontinental spread of written constitutions proved indeed over time almost unstoppable. And Palmer left his readers in no doubt that this was a direct result of the revolution of 1789, but still more of the revolution of 1776. Despite resistance by entrenched elites, and especially from Britain, the greatest single champion of the European counter-revolution, he said, a belief was in being by 1800 that democracy was a matter of concern to the world as a whole, that it was a thing of the future, and that while it was blocked in other countries, the United States should be its refuge. Now, Palmer was writing at a time of Cold War pro-Western and all-American patriotism. But his pioneering transnationalism, together with current interest in the history of democracy, human rights, and liberalism, have given his masterwork a fresh lease of life. In 2010, for instance, David Armitage and Sanjay Subramanian co-edited an excellent set of essays reappraising the age of revolutions. While in another book on the Declaration of Independence, Armitage has credited the American Revolution with provoking a contagion of sovereignty. The revolution's ideas and pioneering written devices, he suggests, help provide for the gradual emergence of a world of states from an earlier world dominated by empires. For Armitage, as for Palmer, 1776 gives rise to forces that prove unidirectional. The origins of our modern world of nation-states, writes Armitage, may be traced back to the American Revolution. Today, I want to propose a more multi-stranded interpretation, both of the long-term consequences of 1776 and of the subsequent wave of written constitutions. I can begin doing so by way of another text, a very different text from R. R. Palmer's great work, but one that is connected to some of its themes. This other text sits in a glass case in a famous museum. Print reproductions of it have circulated for over 200 years. Scholars have debated its interpretation. Millions of visitors have gazed in awe at the original, rightly viewing it as an iconic emblem of its society of origin. As it happens, I am not referring to the original of the American Constitution, now on show at the National Archives in Washington, but to the Rosetta Stone, on display a few blocks from here in the British Museum. An ancient inscribed slab, the Rosetta Stone entered the museum's holdings in 1802, some 13 years after the ratification of the US Constitution. 
Like the latter, the stone was a prize of transcontinental and ideological struggle. A British army wrested the slab from the French, who in turn discovered and appropriated it during Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1799. Throughout the 19th century, the Rosetta Stone was displayed at the British Museum, Richard Parkinson writes, so as to look like a piece of black and white printed text laid out on an angled reading desk, as if silently ignoring its existence as an ancient monument and subsuming it into the world of Western printing. The Rosetta Stone helps to indicate why a broader, more inquiring analysis into the genesis and spread of the new written constitutions is appropriate. The stone's fate and fortunes are a reminder to begin with that the proliferation of constitutions after 1776 was part of a wider and increasingly self-conscious exploitation at this time of language, print, and texts of all kinds. Both revolutionary and established governments, plus all manner of political, scientific, religious, and cultural actors, exhibited growing interest in the potential of words and signs to persuade and inform and to display and extend power. Anglo-French struggle over the stone also illustrates how this increased ingenuity in regard to texts proved the characteristics of empires and not just of emerging nation states. Where and how the Rosetta Stone came ultimately to be manipulated should also prompt us to question the degree to which Britain itself remained aloof from this enhanced culture of public and political writingness. It may appear paradoxical, but the spread of new written constitutions after 1776 and its transcontinental repercussions cannot, in fact, be adequately understood without considering the polity that notoriously still lacks a codified constitution, namely Britain and without examining the vital role played by matters of empire. <coughs> Exposure in Britain to these new political texts, as texts, was both precocious and sustained. This was partly due to Britain's sharing a language and certain legal, political and religious ideas with their one-time American colonists, it was also due to Britain's having access to an unparalleled degree by 1776 to advanced printing and publishing networks. As R. R. Palmer noted, in France, five collected editions of the American state constitutions were published between 1776 and 1786. In England and Scotland, however, there were at least six editions of these texts in 1782 and 1783 alone. By the 1790s, De Bretz of Piccadilly, already well known for its compendia of the landed and the titled, was selling bound copies of the US and by now the various French constitutions, as well as learned analyses such as the Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States by James Wilson and Thomas McKean. Such publications were aimed at the upper end of the reading market, but constitutions were also regularly extracted and discussed in Britain's cheap and illicit press. In 1820, Richard Carlyle devoted six successive issues of his paper, The Republican, to a line-by-line -line analysis of the recently reintroduced Spanish Constitution, drawing attention to its generous franchise provisions and its rejections of a hereditary upper house. As late as 1836, Carlyle was staging celebrations in London 
of the anniversary of Spain's 1812 constitution, attracting what was described as the poorest of the working classes and reading out to anyone who would listen an outline of a new constitution such as should be submitted to the British nation. Ideas about constitutions also evolved and circulated in Britain by way of mouth by way of word of mouth and personal exchange. Throughout the 19th century, as after, London attracted sizable numbers of political refugees, many of whom were advocates of advanced political change. London was peopled with exiles of every kind and every country, wrote an Italian dissident in 1823. Constitutionalists who would have but one chamber, constitutionalists who wished for two, constitutionalists after the French model, after the Spanish model, the American. London was the Elysium, a satirist would say the botany bay of illustrious men and would-be heroes. As this suggests, those making London a city of exiles came from many backgrounds, but immediately before and after Waterloo, a disproportionate number were Hispanic. Many liberals who left Spain after Ferdinand VII returned to Madrid in 1814 sought refuge in London. While over 70, 70 South American independence era leaders of the first rank, plus many lesser figures, lived in the capital at some point between 1808 and 1830. There was the great precursor of Spanish-American independence, Francisco de Miranda, who spent most of the first decade of the 19th century in London and who referred to his house in Grafton Street as the fixed point for the independence and liberties of the Colombian continent. There was Bernardo O'Higgins, the Chilean independence leader, who was part Irish and had been educated in England. There was Lucas Alaman, a future Mexican minister and a leading reformer and conservative theorist. Jose de San Martin, who would pay tribute later to the title of the 17th century revolutionary Oliver Cromwell by declaring himself protector of Peru. And the grand liberator himself, Simon Bolivar, who vi first visited Britain in 1810 and liked to cite it as his primary foreign political influence. The question of how far exposure to Britain influenced the politics of these and other Latin American activists has been widely canvassed. It is clear that most of these men took ideas and strategies from various transatlantic sources. But it is also clear that R. R. Palmer's contention that 1776 dethroned England and set up America as a model for those seeking a better world was much too sweeping. Especially in the 1820s and 30s, the need to restore stability to newly independent states in Latin America made many of its resident and exiled political actors eager to scrutinize British forms of government, still viewed flatteringly enough as an exemplary compound of liberty and order. This was true, for instance, of the writers of the Chilean Constitution of 1833. Abandoning earlier federal projects borrowed from the US, they drafted a new constitution providing for a strong executive, a lower house with the power to approve taxation and the armed forces on an annual basis after the English pattern, and an upper house representing the propertied classes. This 1833 Chilean constitution lasted unaltered for over 60 years. How far the presence of continental European and Latin American constitutional reformers 
plus extensive coverage of the new constitutions in the British and Irish press, and the import and translation of important foreign constitutional texts, affected political ideas within the UK itself has been much less explored. The tendency here as elsewhere for political history to be reconstructed overwhelmingly within national frameworks has militated against such inquiries. So has the notion that Britain has been straightforwardly wedded, at least from the mid 17th century, to an unwritten constitution. This despite the fact that the phrase unwritten constitution only became firmly embedded in British political self-description from the 1870s. Historians in Britain are rarely trained to think or pose questions about written constitutions as political and cultural instruments. While commentators outside this country tend not to associate written constitutions with Britain or the British at all. Yet evidence of the post-1776 surge of constitutions impacting on radicals and reformers within these islands, and not just upon radicals, is abundant. <coughs> Consider John Cartwright, Major Cartwright, as he was usually known. An Englishman who was involved in radical organizing and publishing from before the American Revolution to his death in 1824. Cartwright is normally discussed only with regard to an insular tradition of parliamentary reform. Yet from early on, he identified and adopted what is still one of the strongest arguments for a political constitution being set down in a single recognized text. Namely, that this has the potential of making the workings of a state much better known. A constitution of which not the most learned man can know where to find all its parts, and of which not the most capacious understanding can embrace the whole. What ordinary man shall pretend to scan? Here then is as complete a labyrinth for bewildering men's senses as the most subtle adversary, adversary of freedom can wish for. Since he viewed political participation and knowledge as the birthright of all adult males, though only males, Britain's ever-varying chameleon constitution, as he described it, was anathema to Cartwright. Beacons and landmarks were necessary, he wrote, a politics accessible to every eye. Proposals for a written British constitution, he argued, should be printed, circulated, and submitted to a three-year national discussion. Once agreed on, he wanted the provisions of this new constitution to be inscribed in gold on the interiors of Parliament, just as the Ten Commandments were displayed in churches as guides and rebukes to worshippers. Copies of the constitution should also, he thought, be mass-produced and circulated so as to become a piece of sacred furniture in every household. As the content and choice of language of some of these proposals indicate, Cartwright borrowed from both post-revolutionary France and the new United States. He also had extensive dealings with Hispanic activists, frequently forging connections with such men when they were in London, and employing Hispanic exiles as conduits to reach audiences in Spain and Latin America. Thus, after the Doth de Mayo uprising in 1808, Cartwright began writing to politicians and friends in Spain, urging that the crisis be seized on to remodel the state. Areas of Spain breaking free of French control, he urged, should reunite with Portugal 
as the Commonwealth of the Iberian States. Thought should be given to a new constitution setting out the grand essentials of a free government, a bicameral legislature and an elected regent who should be over 30 years of age and serve only five years. Provisions that were clearly modelled on the US Constitution's rule for the presidency, but more rigorous. The whole secret, Cartwright wrote to a Spanish liberal some years later, consists in the laws being made and administered by the people. There were other Cartwright constitutional initiatives, including a provisional constitution for Greece, sent to its newly established Congress in 1822, and a constitutional instrument for Mexico the following year, which was discussed by that country's Committee of Constitutions. The more Cartwright aged, the more ingenious his constitutional projects became. He advised Greek independence fighters to reproduce lines from the constitution he designed for them on their copper coins, thus rendering money a circulating medium of constitutional knowledge. Knowledge is power. Cartwright's brand of internationalism helps account for his close working relationship with Jeremy Bentham, another far better known London-based writer of constitutions. At different stages of his career, Bentham sketched out a constitution for France, a new legal code for the United States, and a constitutional code for Poland. He produced a commentary on a new Portuguese constitution, a revision of Spain's legal code, a draft of a co constitutional code for Greece, and a constitution for Tripoli, the first serious attempt by a Western actor to explore how the new politics might be applied to an Islamic society. Above all, Bentham devoted attention to Latin America, a continent to which he twice considered emigrating. During the 1820s, he set out constitutional proposals for Buenos Aires, Guatemala, and Venezuela, and he designed a mammoth constitution for Colombia containing 191 articles. These schemes, of which at least a few had some, some practical impact, are well known. But Bentham's evident confidence that individuals from one country could pronounce authoritatively on the constitutional reordering of another country merits far more scrutiny. Although sometimes critical of the European empires and increasingly negative about Britain's own political system, Bentham seems instinctively to have accepted, as John Cartwright also tended to do, that Anglo-Saxons on both sides of the Atlantic might well possess a superior capacity for rule. This emerges in the conviction that Bentham sometimes shared with his disciple James Mill that even authoritarian British rule in the Indian subcontinent might be an improvement on indigenous government. It emerges, too, in Bentham's dealings with Aaron Burr, one-time vice president of the United States, in regard to the latter's schemes to make himself emperor of Mexico. Burr told me I should be the legislator, Bentham recorded proudly, and he would send a ship of war for me. He said the Mexicans would all follow like a flock of sheep. This belief that men with English-bred minds, as Bentham put it, were better equipped for inventing and implementing systems of rule also informed his proposals in 1822 for a proto-Panama-type canal. He envisaged this as being funded by British investors and constructed on land ceded by what was then Mexico to the Anglo-American United States. The US government was 
an institution which has long been in the habit of taking an infant state to nurse, Bentham reasoned. Witness Indiana, Illinois, Alabama, Missouri, and how excellent a dry nurse the US president has always been. By contrast, the Hispanic and indigenous inhabitants of Central America, Bentham thought, were not as yet of sufficient age to go alone. Such notions of an innate Anglo-American capacity to reorganize others for their own good would have a long history. As Bentham's projects illustrate, enthusiasm for devising new constitutions as engines of improvement and freedom sometimes merged among advanced radicals, but also among other political actors, with an ambition to manage, control, and even invade. That this might be the case formed part from Edmund Burke's reflections onwards of the conservative critique of the new constitutionalism. Consider in this regard the voyage of Captain Pompanilla, an early and very Burkean novel published in 1828 by Benjamin Disraeli, a future Tory prime minister and a deeply unsuccessful speculator in Mexican mines. The eponymous hero of Disraeli's novel is a native of an island in the Indian Ocean who stumbles upon a shipwrecked cargo of useful <coughs> knowledge. Through reading these improving water-stained volumes, Pompanilla learns to speak, writes Disraeli with heavy irony, in sentences which would not have disgraced the mellifluous pen of Bentham. From here, Pompanilla advances to a little badinage on the Bill of Rights and flew off to an airy apesu of the French Revolution. Banished from his home island on account of his overzealous enthusiasm for advanced views, Pompanilla ends up on a very different island, a society that views itself as the savior and champion of civil and religious liberty in all quarters of the globe, and that seeks to impose constitutional bliss on others. A whole corps diplomatique and another ship full of abstract philosophers were immediately ordered off to the West and shortly after to render their first principles still more effective and their administrative arrangements still more influential. Some brigades of infantry and a detachment of guards followed. Free constitutions are apt to be misunderstood until half of the nation are bayoneted and the rest imprisoned. I believe, remarks a character towards the end of the novel, that we call it the colonial system. <laughs> this mode of conservative polemic could draw power from the fact that those regimes most conspicuously associated with the onset of new constitutions, France and the United States, were also markedly expansionist. <coughs> As Stuart Wolfe analyzes, written constitutions formed an integral part of Napoleon's perception of how to lay foundations for effective and durable imperial control within Europe. Sometimes, as in the case of the Westphalia Constitution in 1807, Napoleon deployed these instruments to create new client states. But as with the constitution for the Duchy of Warsaw, which he personally drafted that same year, Napoleon also used these devices to remodel existing states in accordance with his strategic and ideological objectives. The imperial and managerial potential of written constitutions was also in evidence on the other side of the Atlantic. Many factors helped to drive American expansionism after independence.
but it was undoubtedly facilitated by new constitutions. As Max Edling and others have demonstrated, the federal constitution was designed in some respects, in some respects, to strengthen the authority and reach of the central government. One of the founders' initiatives, for instance, was to ensure that treaties approved in Washington became the law of the land binding on judges in every state. It was partly by means of adroit, centrally devised and centrally implemented treaties with Native Americans and with the European empires that the USA was able to triple in size between 1783 and 1850. Moreover, and as Michael Mann analyzes in his Chilling the Dark Side of Democracy, the Jeffersonian vision of we the people proved at once egalitarian and democratic in some of its tendencies and simultaneously often <coughs> ethnically exclusive. The more the settler democracy, the more the ethnic exclusivity. Growing numbers of white settlers moving westwards and southwards through the American continent were encouraged to draft their own state constitutions, which interlocked with the federal constitution and which usually excluded Native Americans and blacks as well as females from full citizenship. By so ordering, Washington put in place a powerfully effective set of mechanisms whereby the new American Republic became able to consolidate and represent itself as a continent-wide nation while simultaneously implementing overland empire. To acknowledge this is in no way to deny the revolutionary potential of the new constitutions or their great contribution in many areas to widening rights and political participation. <coughs> but it is to suggest that accounts of these devices and their spread have sometimes been overly triumphalist and teleological and too narrowly formulated. By their very nature, written constitutions were and are ambivalent volatile documents. As well as widening rights, they could and can discriminate against the illiterate and the semi-literate. Unless available in multiple translations, written constitutions could and can disadvantage a state's minority linguistic groupings. In other ways, too, Written constitutions over time have often defined citizenship in such a way as to marginalize and exclude elements of a population and not simply and invariably to liberate them. Yet although an immense amount of work has been undertaken in recent decades on how writing, print and texts can be employed as tools of power, this more searching and skeptical scholarship has had limited impact on the study of written constitutions. This is doubly strange given that many prominent early exponents of written constitutions also displayed an interest in language and its uses more broadly. Thus Thomas Jefferson favored the study of Native American languages, though only for antiquarian purposes. While Andres Bello, another Hispanic exile in London and the writer of Chile's civil code and possibly of sections of its 1833 constitution, also authored a short essay on the origin and progress of the art of writing. The transcontinental spread of political constitutions after 1776 thus needs situating in broader and more diverse textual contexts. 
It can profitably be examined, for instance, alongside the contemporaneous surge of missionary activity on both sides of the Atlantic, with its accompanying much wider distribution of Bibles and other religious texts. The new written constitutionalism also needs examining in relation to the proliferation from the mid-18th century on both sides of the Atlantic of new grammar books and dictionaries, texts that were designed again at once to inform and to regulate and set bounds. Only think of the wording of Samuel Johnson's proposal in 1747 for his new dictionary. In this, Johnson compares himself to the soldiers of Caesar and expresses the hope that while he might not complete the conquest, I shall at least discover the coast, civilize part of the inhabitants, and make it easy for some other adventurer to proceed further, to reduce them wholly to subjection and settle them under laws. Here, as some philosophers of language at this time acknowledged, was a heightened awareness of the potential of language and texts to mold and to manage. And just as the roots of and influences on the new written constitutions were mixed in this way, so as we have already seen were the uses. It was soon recognized, for instance, that written constitutions could cater to monarchical regimes, not just republics. In 1811, Henri Christophe, a one-time slave and black revolutionary, employed a new written constitution in order to proclaim himself hereditary king of Haiti and to establish a nominated aristocracy. More established monarchies also learned very quickly how to, how to exploit the new devices. In the 1830s, prints were being distributed in Portugal, displaying richly dressed members of its royal family clustering around and proudly holding a copy of the country's written constitution. The degree to which the new constitutions possessed multiple roots and multiple applications helps to explain why reactions to them in Britain at all levels, and not just among radicals like Cartwright and Bentham, proved nuance, shifting, and often adaptive. Official British responses to revolutionary French constitution making, revolutionary French constitution making, were to be sure overwhelmingly negative. Yet the virulence of what R. R. Palmer styled Britain's counter-revolution should not obscure the degree to which this country was itself swept along by a wider, more writing-based politics. Thus, in 1803, the House of Commons began allocating seats to journalists so that for the first time, verbatim accounts of its debates could be published in the newspaper press. The onset of new constitutions abroad also fostered a more intensive and modified cult here of Magna Carta. The number of parliamentary allusions to Magna Carta made and recorded between the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and 1800 is 20 times higher, 20 times higher than the total number of such references recorded between 1761 and 1775. At both elite and non-elite levels, there was an increased tendency to represent Magna Carta as a kind of pioneering written constitution, our constitution, as a former government minister described it in 1808 
reimagining and repositioning Magna Carta in this fashion served at one level to buttress conservative arguments that Britain had no need of a new paper constitution because it already possessed the first such foundational and exemplary text. Thus, when the Cadiz Constitution was drafted in 1812, the local British ambassador felt able to rationalize his support for this quite radical document by remarking smoothly that his countrymen would be able to acknowledge with applause this Magna Carta of all good Spaniards. Yet as this comment suggests, the fact that Britain possessed ancient venerated constitutional texts of its own could also work to ease acceptance of the new style written constitutions. The degree to which even sections of Britain's political elite had partially internalized the new fogue, vogue for constitutional writingness emerges in the parliamentary debates leading up to the Reform Act of 1832. Both opponents and supporters of the Reform Bill repeatedly referred to it as a new constitution. He should suppose the Reform Bill a sheet of white paper accused one opponent, on which the government thought proper to place a new constitution. Yet what was striking about these kind of critiques leveled at the Reform Bill was that their impact proved limited. Persons were somewhat startled when the words new constitution first met their ears, noticed another MP in 1831. <coughs> But now the expression was received and used without hesitation. It was only later in the 19th century, from about the 1870s, that British commentators became more unvaryingly and explicitly insistent on the quintessential non-writingness of their constitution. You can check Hansard online now. The phrase unwritten constitution is hardly used at all before 1850 and remains rare until the 1870s and after. Partial British accommodation to the new constitutionalism was also eased by considerations of global prestige and intervention a desire to ensure continuing respect for their own political system meant that far from straightforwardly othering the new constitutionalism, Britain's governing elite sought instead selectively to exploit and endorse it. At one level, this involved expressing approval of and sometimes actively assisting those foreign written constitutions that embodied or that could be represented as embodying aspects of Britain's own system of government. Thus, after Bolivar drafted a constitution in 1826 for the South American Republic bearing his name, the immediate reaction of the British consul at Lima was one of national self-congratulation. The new Bolivian constitution, he assured George Canning, was founded apparently on the basis of the British constitution, allowing useful liberty, but obviating any mischievous excess of popular power. In much the same way, the Statuto of Piedmont Sardinia, one of the few 1848 written constitutions to endure, was widely celebrated in Britain, even by conservatives, on the grounds that it incorporated <coughs> political institutions most nearly resembling our own. And 
increasingly you get this. By the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, British apologists are increasingly stressing the unwritten constitution here, but equally stressing the contribution of Britain to written constitutions elsewhere. Increasingly, indeed, the new constitutionalism was viewed as posing challenges to which it was necessary that Britain's official classes respond in some way. An obvious way of responding was for the British themselves to attempt writing constitutions, but in their own style. Efforts at doing this began very early. In 1780, the British cabinet drafted a charter for groups of American loyalists, which was designed to parry the ideas of the revolutionaries and serve as a blueprint for a new American constitution in the event of imperial victory. British and British supported actors also tried their hands at drafting constitutions during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, especially in the Mediterranean regions in places like Corsica, Sicily and the Ionian Islands. Uh, the Ionian Island uh, constitution, one of the more conservative documents the British produce at this period, is interestingly styled constitution of the United States of the Ionian Islands, um, an epithet which suggests how the British both tried to absorb aspects of the age of the revolution while also, of course, trying to repel them. As we've seen, written constitutions have often, among many other things, served managerial and expansionist purposes. So it was scarcely surprising that some British actors were eager to experiment with them in regions of overseas influence and imperial effort. British attempts to use written constitutions to ease power and influence overseas would continue until the end of the 20th century and are not fully over yet. But let me end today with an episode in British constitution writing that brings together many of the points I have been advancing. As Miles Taylor has shown, the idea that Britain remained immune to the multiple revolutions of 1848 is only partially correct. After 1848, Taylor writes, constitutional change was hurried through in virtually all British dependencies and colonies. By the mid-1850s, most colonial constitutions bore little resemblance to what had existed before 1848. In regard to the settlement colonies, colonial reformers in Britain had started agitating for new constitutions even before 1848. They did so in part under the influence of Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which was translated into English soon after its publication in 1835. Growing interest in devising constitutional texts for the settlement colonies was also fostered by developments in the United States. Over the course of the 1840s, U.S. expansion reached the Pacific. Both the scale now of America's overland empire and Washington's success in threading this continent-wide construct together by a network of written constitutions encouraged colonial reformers in Britain to argue that its settlement empire, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the Cape also required new paper constitutions if it was to cohere and endure. As this again underlines, Britain was ineluctably caught up in post-1776 transatlantic trends of new constitution making 
that spread and flourished in part, in part, because they catered not simply to nation-making and rights, but also to imperial projects of different kinds. But there were always risks. Always written constitutions proved mixed and volatile instruments. When in the late 1840s and early 1850s, London dispatched new constitutional acts to the Australian colonies, it provoked a storm. Groups of white settler activists successfully agitated for greater degrees of democracy and local autonomy, though of course only for whites. One of the leading New South Wales activists involved was a John Dunmore Lang, a Scots Presbyterian minister. Lang exemplifies how wide and how intricate the Atlantic world of constitutional politics could be. His mother had been radicalized by listening to a sermon in Scotland given by John Witherspoon, one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence. Lang himself traveled extensively in the United States and Europe, and both regions shaped his political ideas. One of his pet schemes, for instance, was to set up a colony on a Pacific island and settle it with German political refugees from the 1848 revolutions. Like many other individuals in the 19th century, Lang also devoted time to drafting his own amateur constitutions. And I think we've forgotten this aspect of the surge of new written constitutions. Huge numbers of individuals in the 19th century are drafting their own constitutions, which really needs serious study. And it's beginning now in the United States because it suggests alternative visions of what territory should be. And it suggests how plastic many of these territories still appear. Um, but it, it's, it, it, it's something like keeping a diary, as far as I can see. The number of people who draft constitutions is astonishing. In many of Lang's draft amateur constitutions, Australia is set to become an independent democratic republic, just like the United States. And this is the aspect of Lang that is memorialized now in Australian patriotic historiography. But Lang's pet amateur constitutions show another side of him. This new Australian republic, as Lang saw it, would go on to annex Fiji the New Hebrides, and New Guinea, while its white inhabitants would at least strive to raise the Aborigines to their own higher level. The city of Sydney dreamed Lang as he penned one of his constitutions would become the permanent headquarters of the future Australian empire. Thank you. Thanks for what was a fascinating uh, and uh, very comprehensive, both uh, geographically and uh, historically, uh, in terms of its uh, coverage of uh, constitution writing. Uh, I found uh, the uh, placement of uh, such, uh, what I thought, national figures like uh, Disraeli, Bentham, and Cartwright within the uh, transnational uh, culture of uh, uh, Atlantic constitutionalism truly fascinating. And I'm sure the audience has uh, many questions. and. Professor Cody has uh, consented to spend some time answering them. So who's going to start at all? Perhaps they all want to drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, why do you think these were 
Latin American um, national leaders, Bolivar, San Martín, and the rest of them, why did they all come clustering in London? I mean, you can see that once there were a group of them here, then London was the place that they established their sort of uh, exile. Mm -hmm. But why London in the first instance? Why not Washington or New York or... Uh, well, yeah, or Philadelphia. Paris, probably, politically at that time, Paris was not a, a friendly place. I think there's all sorts of reasons. Uh, I mean, clearly part of the reason is if you want to drive out the Spanish and Portuguese, where are you going to go? You're not going to go to the infant republic of the United States because, you know, its armed forces are still quite limited. You go to Protestant Britain, which has traditionally uh, fought against the Catholic powers. Um, also, for some, the United States, and this is increasingly true as the 19th century grows on, um, the, the, you, I mean, unusually, and after 1807, 1808, the British don't intend to move into Latin America territorially uh, with investments, yes, but they don't expect to grab land there. Whereas the United <laughs> States... Um, you don't trust, and with people like Aaron Burr hoping to become Emperor of Mexico, that's, that's not surprising. But it's also that the press networks in London are so extensive, and there's so many, um, and, and those of you who are Latin Americanists will know this much more than I do, uh, the number of Latin American newspapers and pamphlets that are being produced in London because the print culture is, is so extensive here. But I do think, as I say, that for, for some, certainly people like Bayo and, and indeed Bolivar, um, Britain appeals in part because it is seen rightly or wrongly, as an amalgam of liberty and order. And you want order, having driven the Spanish or the Portuguese out. You have to establish new orderly states. Um, I was very struck by your emphasis on the fiction that Britain doesn't have a rigid constitution in the early 19th century. And it's Badgett, really, who, who gives us the phrase that we all know of the, the unwritten constitution. Sort of arising from that, the historical moment you're describing, the constitutionalist moment, the first couple of decades of the 19th century, where do you situate um, the campaign for civil and political rights for non-Anglicans in that? Which isn't just a matter of the Irish looking for capital emancipation, it's a matter of people like Burdett and Romilly and various radicals making a big thing of this. Could you sort of expand on that in your constitutionalist framework? Because Religious rights is something you didn't mention, but it's very mm. much part of your story. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think, I think a lot more work needs to be done on this. Uh, it, because it is this, this problem that, that scholars of... It's not just scholars of British high politics that are often insular. It's scholars of British low politics that are often insular and don't look at how written constitutions and constitutional writing in other parts of the Atlantic world and elsewhere are, are sort of affecting the various political causes here. Um, and I think the, the, the struggle for religious rights and, and seeing what is happening in other constitutions in regard to religious rights. I mean, there's no doubt that for many British uh, and, I, I believe, Irish radicals, the United States Constitution, this is one of the most striking things, the fact that, you know, there is, uh, there is no state church, uh, that it is uh, a much more flexible, or at least that's the ideal, uh, religious structure. Um, and similarly, in many of Napoleon's constitutions, these are imperial constitutions, but they're also uh, quite enlightened in many respects. They're enlightened in regard to religious freedom. They're enlightened in giving freedom to Jews. 
Uh, so I think these constitutions that are extensively, really extensively printed and extracted in the British and the Irish press, the ideas that people in these islands are picking up from these written constitutions, um, it, it needs much more discussion. Okay, we have one at the back, three questions uh, in, in a queue, and I'll take some more later, but I believe you, have you heard that? Yeah. No? Yeah. Yes. I wondered how your argument applied to the Indian subcontinent. For example, was there any attempt to, uh, on the princely of states, to, uh, states, to uh, ask them or impose on them a written constitution to regulate how they operated in accordance, so that they were in accordance with what the British objectives were? It's an interesting question which I can't satisfactorily answer at this stage. I mean, I deliberately chose Atlantic World for my title because I haven't quite got to. I mean, there are all sorts of changes in the charters of the East India Company in the 1830s. And again, the language of a new constitution is applied to some of these changes. But I haven't done research yet as to whether there is overlap. I mean, certainly, as uh, Chris Bailey has shown in a recent book, there are attempts by indigenous Indian liberals in the 1820s and 30s to adopt some of these ideas from constitutionalism and apply it to Indian purposes. Um, and certainly some of these uh, Indian activists like uh, Roy have, have contacts with British dissidents. So I would be astonished if there wasn't some kind of overlap and connection there. But I haven't done the work, so I can't say for certain. I was um, intrigued by your reference to these um, amateur constitution writers, uh, uh, because presumably the, the act of official of, of constitution writing is a formal state act by lawyers. Who were these people and what did they think they were doing? Um, some of them were adventurers. Um, there's a lot of um, rascals and adventurers involved at all levels of uh, state making and empire making in the 19th century, of course. Um, partly because uh, at a distance, nobody quite knows what is true and what is not. Um, there's a, a wonderful Scottish guy, uh, I've forgotten his name, who in the 1820s, and he, he, he fights for one of the Spanish-American independence armies. And when he gets back to Britain, he claims that in return for his exploits, he's been given land in Central America, which is going to be his. It's going to be his state. Um, and in order to convince everybody that this is indeed true, he produces pamphlets of what the laws of this Central American Republic are, and he prints a constitution. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, this is, this is a complete rascal, but he's, he's learned what a constitution should look like. And he prints this constitution so that people will believe this Central American Republic exists. And about 200 poor Highland Scots emigrate to go there, most of whom never return. So, but, but I think a lot of time it wasn't anything. Um, a lot of radicals, I mean, Robert Owen uh, is, is constantly drafting constitutions for his, his new, um, I mean, it, 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 drafting constitutions at all levels blends, I think, with different strands of utopianism. Uh, with wanting to remake the world. Um, I think a, a lot of idealists draft constitutions, but so do rascals, so do ambitious men who, who want to break up the United States. I mean, the number of n new constitutions drafted within the United States by people, for example, they want to set up an independent Texas, they want to set up an independent California, um, and that's why these so-called amateur constitutions matter, because they show how much in flux things still are. Victor. Well, you were talking about Sir McGregor, it was a kingdom. Yes. 
Thank you. But I would like you to explore the difference between forward-looking constitutions and backward-looking constitutions. If, if we had a constitution today in this country, unless it was combined with a referendum abolishing the monarchy or something, it would be backward-looking. It would essentially be best practice written down, and there'd be a few aspirational elements in it, but not that many. If you create a new polity like the United States of America, clearly you need a constitution. And Britain was very comfortable with that idea when they were dealing with <coughs> decolonization or federation in Australia or the Dominions or whatever it was. So I suppose for me the puzzle is why in 1802, when a new entity was created uh, in the United Kingdom, why wasn't there a constitution written down at that point? I assume 1707 would have been too early mm -hmm. because the mind wasn't focused on that. Why not in 82? The Act of Union with Ireland. Yeah. Um, well, of course, it's very interesting, uh, and it, uh, it shows the bias that we have here, that um, it is called the, the Act of Union, and, 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 and the term constitution is not applied to it, whereas if you look, uh, and Roy Foster will know this infinitely better than I, if you look at the parliamentary debates, uh, in the British Parliament in, uh, when they're leading up to what becomes the Act of Union. Uh, one of the interesting aspects which you know, people like Sheridan are, 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 are stressing is they're saying, how can you criticize the revolutionary French for trying to remake territories and apply a piece of paper to them? What do you think this is? Is this not a new constitution? Um, of course, Pitt the Younger doesn't want to go there. Um, but it, it is interesting that uh, those arguments are being deployed. Um, yeah. But, I mean, another thing I was going to say, and I just didn't have time to talk about it, <coughs> is there is a great deal of overlap, I think, between British traditional uses of charters and the newer constitutionalism. I think there's all kinds of overlap there. I mean, there's no doubt that one of the reasons why American revolutionaries can so quickly draft new state constitutions and ultimately the federal constitution is that they're used to a political culture of charters. Uh, and I mean, part of what I was, what was behind um, some of my argument today is that the idea that you still see presented that American independence and federal constitution making creates a divide in political thinking and practice between the two sides of the Atlantic. It's, it's just not like that. It's far more messy. Yes, on this point of of writing constitutions. Presumably, you have to have some legal background. Not for amateur writing, but at least you have to copy some legal documents. Surely the American states, many of them were lawyers, mm -hmm. and today they're even more. So what role would the legal, and Britain would be very important that, for getting uh, whether they were for or against a lawyer, doesn't really matter. He's making a case. He doesn't care mm -hmm. <laughs> what system you have. So what role would that play? Well, just the, presumably 100 years before, the legal establishment was much, much smaller than by 1800. Um, I think the relationship and attitudes of the legal profession in this country uh, with and to the new constitutions um, is a huge area that, again, uh, you know, needs a a lot more work um, and again I think it's 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 often been caricatured I mean everybody talks about Blackstone's commentaries and the stress on parliamentary sovereignty and therefore because parliamentary parliament is sovereign there cannot be any notion of a written constitution but 
it was never that cut and dried, in fact. I mean, even Blackstone in the late 1750s publishes a book on Magna Carta, which is hardly ever read. Um, and in this book on Magna Carta, there's a wonderful drawing which shows a sylvan Briton nestling under a great charter hanging in the sky. I mean, here is you know, the importance of text, of writingness. So even Blackstone, it seems to me, uh, his ideas are complex here. But where I think lawyers in this country are going to become increasingly active is, of course, in colonial constitution making. Um, and this goes right up to and beyond figures like Ivor Jennings, um, who is constantly on the plane after the Second World War, buzzing round between uh, places that are about to be given independence, or in some cases places that are already independent, but expect uh, and accept that British lawyers will draft their constitutions for them. What do you mean by distant reading? Um, um, so I think Franco Moretti's term about reading a vast course of text over a hundred years, so rather than a close reading of legal debates or parliamentary debates, you'll, you'll see when the word magna carta pop up in, and in what context. Mm. I don't think I would want to confine myself either to close reading or distant reading because it seems to me that a lot of this has been lost a lot of the what occurs to me anyway as the interesting aspect of a lot of this has been lost partly because the history of written constitutions is so often confined within patriotic and nationalist bounds and the way that these texts are <laughs> spreading across the globe and influencing each other has therefore not been given the attention it should but also because um, the people who have written on constitutions of this sort, often with a degree of expertise that is far beyond my reach, have come from legal scholarship. And legal scholars understandably ask certain questions. The sort of questions I'm posing are different. I, I cannot compete and do not wish to compete with the kind of legal close analysis of precisely what the role of the judiciary is in a particular written constitution. There's a room for that kind of analysis. It's not what I'm doing. I'm sorry, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the best I can say. Okay. Went here. Um, I spoke the 1780 draft constitution for um, the British America. Mm -hmm. How widely circulated was it? And did the revolutionaries actually offer any response to it? It never really got off the ground, um, partly because local loyalists said, oh, we don't like the look of this. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's an intriguing document, partly because it is so ideologically engaged. It's, it's, it's London conservative ministers with a small c writing down the kind of America they would like. Uh, and they're prepared to give all kinds of concessions, but they do not like the disorder, the democracy, you know. So it's a really intriguing document, and I'm rather surprised that more hasn't been made of it. But you know, if you have any doubts about the ideological gulf between those pushing the war uh, in London and those fighting against British dominion, um, this document... Uh, it, it's a huge <laughs> ideological gulf. But the, the loyalists didn't want it, not, not because I think of the conservative ideology, but I think they, you know, they realized this was not going to be easy to push. Yep. Uh, technology is moving very fast. 
and the possibility uh, exists today uh, for there to be an e-constitution. What do you have to say about that? Um, I, I think the rapid communication of constitutions uh, is a very important part of the story. Um, and it was an absolutely brilliant invention that whatever you think of its immediate and local political impact, written constitutions were designed to spread. Uh, you know, they, they can be communicated so easily. Uh, I don't think it's personally that um, uh, Communicating them is is the problem. It's what you put in them and how far yeah, they. People will be putting um, whatever they want to uh, on the issue, and uh, you know, they will be able to communicate it. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, what are the These are issues that fortunately I don't have to uh, <laughs> deal with. Um, I think it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, I was in Delhi just before Christmas. Um, and of course, what one, uh, I mean, I, I know this because of what I'm working on, but I know it from Indian friends. Um, the 1947 Indian constitution, massive text, is one of the most successful post-colonial constitutions. It's a remarkable document. Um, but quite a lot of Indians now feel that it, it's too close to the British. It's too close to the colonial text of 1935, on which it was indeed substantially modeled in some ways. Um, and I was intrigued when I was in India looking on the web to, to, to look at these various suggestions as to how the Indian constitution could be changed. And there was one guy who, said, who was, I suspect from his writing, a Hindu nationalist, and he was saying, um, well, we need a, a, a new Indian constitution that can be adapted to all third world countries. Um, and, and, and he, he, he was doing his best, but then he got caught in the trap. He said, we need a new constitution for superpower imperial India. <laughs> and there it was. You know, he couldn't get away from it. So, so it's, I think, how... But uh, I don't mean to be irreverent. I mean, I do think it is a post-colonial challenge. How, how do you take this extraordinary political device that is rooted in empire as well as rights and how do you reinvent it for the world now and as you say how how do you ratify it how do you get the element of popular input most written constitutions in the past have been creations of elites uh, and obviously you need legal experts, but how then do you give them wider acceptability? It is a massive issue.